Hello. Hello. Welcome, audience out there in the world. Uh, this is the panel all on um, online interactive fiction and collaborative storytelling uh, games online. Um, specifically, this is, uh, we've all been in the pandemic. We've been playing games online. A lot of us have been like going onto Roll20 and things like that. And um, I find uh, I've been really interested in experiences that are using technology that is designed for this online play. Um, there are some things out there like Twine and other tools uh, that allow people to create games. Um, and I've brought on, uh, and those games like have a range of experiences. And some of them are just kind of more just like author to reader, like that are more interactive fiction type stuff. So I've wanted to bring people along bring people in uh, that have been working in this space. Um, uh, my name is Colin Farian. I am uh, on the staff of Big Bad Con. I've designed their, I've been working on managing the website and the new website is my design, all front end development stuff. And I enjoy this development and weird space. So it's, it's a highly interesting to me. Um, I'm gonna, our, our panels today are Randy Lupin, Doug Valenta, and Judith Pintar. And I'm going to pass it off to them, and they're going to introduce themselves and what they've been working on. And after that, we're going to get into a discussion about this weird world of online storytelling. So, Randy Lupin. Hi, my name is Randy Lupin, uh, calling in from San Francisco, California. I'm a game designer and an entrepreneur. And on the game design side, breaks into a few categories. So I design consumer games through diegetic games. I make serious games for organizations through my organization, Leveraged Play. And, uh, and I'm also the creator of StorySynth, which is most relevant to our conversations today. Uh, StorySynth is a super simple online platform for designing, playing, and sharing storytelling games. And uh, to give you a sense of how it works, you can add a bunch of prompts or game content into a Google spreadsheet share that link, copy paste that link into the StorySynth website at storysynth.org, and it will automatically build your game. And once it builds your game, you can just play it right in the browser, on your phone, on your computer, and you can share that link um, and to jump, you can jump into a session and then share that link. And everybody at that same session, session link sees the same content at the same time. So it's started off being designed for games like For the Queen and The Quiet Year, really heavy on prompts. Uh, there are a variety of different ways you can play now, too. There's a, a hex flower mode, a generator uh, mode, and, and plenty, plenty more uh, in the mix, as well as lots of ways to customize it, both for people who don't know how to code at all and for people who have a little bit of, of coding competency if they really want to get in there and change up the style. So I've been thinking a lot about how do we port the sort of prompt-driven storytelling um, that's so popular around the table to a web experience, and then what does that unlock once we've done that? Uh, also, maybe relevant to some of the conversation today, on the serious games side, I've uh, designed games related to election threat casting, to uh, the future of artificial intelligence and the future of the web that have all been run online. And those are kind of like LARPy simulation-y things that we've been able to take advantage of the digital environment too, to be able to do things online that would not be possible in person. So happy to, to maybe bring up some examples from there too. That's a bit about me. Thank you, Randy. And we'll uh, jump to Doug here and, and the amazing stuff he's been working on. Hi, I'm Doug Valena. I want to start by thanking Colin for inviting me to join this panel today. I feel like I'm in esteemed company with Randy and Judith, and I'm very flattered and a little intimidated to be here. Um, I'm a, I'm a self-taught computer programmer from a young age. It's kind of cliche, but I got started creating text games in BASIC and later QBASIC. Um, programming has been a, a lifelong hobby for me. It's how I got interested in interactive fiction in the mid 2000s. Uh, I'm also a trained musician, a hobbyist composer, a produced playwright, a former independent theater artist and a lapsed film student. So this kind of like expression, creativity and performance are like very much in my bones. It's how I met my husband, John, uh, producing independent theater together in Chicago. John is a trained operatic tenor and stage director and a retired drag performer who now works in branding and design. But in the 90s, he was a major player of what is now the still active Dragon Realms mud. Um, so in 2018, John and I began work on a project that has become Moat. This came out of our shared love of 
the written word of interactive fiction, of MUDs, and it really began as this attempt to create a modern platform for authoring and sharing text-based virtual worlds. John and I have this very conversational design process. We've spent a very, very long time talking about Moat, and those conversations are also often in dialogue with my explorations in code. And through that, we had this sort of eureka moment where we realized that we did not have to make rules and that we could kind of short circuit a classic interactive fiction parser. At that time, we were also kind of exploring ways to improve the user experience of a MUD inspired by the way that like, for example, Slack merges together, multiple users leaving and entering a channel at the same time. And it clicked for us that we could kind of reconceive of the role of the parser and the engine in the MUD to be about narrating player actions instead of enforcing with the goal being output that wasn't like a chat log, but was instead prose fiction. Uh, I went into a lot more detail on that and the tech behind it in my 2020 Narrowscope talk, which you can find on YouTube. But basically, we were finding we were creating a platform for real-time collaborative, story collaborative storytelling. Although, like, it took us a long time to kind of find those words and put them in that order because that wasn't really a thing. So several months into this project, we realized we weren't creating a game with rules or a virtual world with physics, but rather an instrument. Mo is something that you play like a flute not or like a harp, not like you play a game. And moat players interact like jazz players, not like game players. Uh, and when you think about what you're creating as a musical instrument, that kind of, with, with, with things about it that you can master, it just kind of turns a lot of the ideas about software development and user experience totally on their head. So our goal is to create a platform for these kinds of instruments that harmonize and dissonate and vibrate in a medium of live and dynamic text. <laughs> It's a medium for creating and playing games, for authoring and remixing art, for self-expression and self-exploration. We're not there yet, but we're building something. So it took us maybe an embarrassingly long time to realize how well TTRPGs and especially story games translate onto Moat, probably because we started in such a different place. But this year we really invested in gaming on Moat. We commissioned a collection of one-shot story games that are designed specifically for Moat by an amazing cohort of designers, including Avery Alder, Sharing Biswas, Yansu Julian Kim, Aaron A. Reed, Julian K. Jarbo. I'm super excited to discuss gaming and storytelling online today, especially how we can center role play and storytelling and collaboration and online play and support those with technology. Thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, you, I, you said in your email earlier that you've been working with Avery and all these people. Um, I Avery is a friend of mine, and she's amazing. And so I, I'm excited about all the work that you've been doing. Um, and for that, uh, move on to Judith. Judith has a big experience with uh, with this interactive fiction thing. So. Um, so lots of things that Doug said were very exciting and reminded me of me. So of course I love them. And I, um, I, I came to interactive fiction via um, theater, the theater world. Uh, I was a professional storyteller and I was a Rennie. And um, at the point when um, I started, um, I became a children's theater director in schools. And um, I also booked myself uh, at some schools as teaching interactive fiction. And I did this long ago. Um, um, so I've been in the IF world a long time um, through the 90s. And uh, partly because of my long view, I'm on the board of directors of the Interactive Fiction Technology Foundation. And if you're unaware of IFTIF, uh, you should have a look. That website is iftechfoundation.org. And we are the people who, um, I guess you could say cherish and care for um, the artifacts that belong to the interactive fiction community writ large, uh, IFDB and uh, um, and uh, IFComp and um, lots of things um, that we do and are always looking for volunteers. Uh, most recently, our venture has been Neroscope. Um, as Doug mentioned, he was a speaker there in 2020. Um, so, that, so some of what I do with IFTIF will probably uh, come up. My day job is that um, I teach at the University of Illinois in the, in the School of Information Sciences and in the Game Studies and Design um, program. Um, I teach game design and I teach interactive fiction, particularly I teach a uh, parser-based interactive fiction using Inform 7. Um, I love Twine, I, I, I love and write in hypertext, but I um, am more deeply in love 
with um, parser-based interactive fiction. And before I taught uh, in Form 7, I taught AGT, uh, which ages me, goes way back. Um, but I teach in Form 7 to students in game design classes, and I teach it to students in classes of any subject. Where the subject of the course is not game design, I teach it as uh, a way to turn in your homework. In other words, <laughs> Um, I, I remember before PowerPoint, um, my kids, I have, uh, when my kids were in grade school, when PowerPoint became a thing in, in school, and suddenly you could turn in your homework, not on a piece of paper written in a pencil, but using a PowerPoint, and it was radical. And so somehow in the back of my mind, I would like us to get to the place where kids in school can turn their homework in, in, in the form of an interactive document. Where the, where their where their student where their teacher can actually you know go deeper with them about their thoughts and interact with it as opposed to a, something that gets judged. So I think about um, I have pedagogy a lot. So if if I start to talk too much about education, stop me. But um, so in a in the my game design class, the straight up game design class, I have a project a game that's called the Quad Game. And it's been started in 2016, and every new class picks up where the last class left off. So um, I call it um, um, massive multi-authored IF. So it's had more than 100 uh, distinct authors uh, since 2016. It's got in it 700 locations, 1,500 objects, uh, 400 NPCs, 551 endings, and at my last count, it's about 250,000 words of story and code. It, it's massive. So I call it, it's a collaborative IF sandbox. So um, there's a couple of things I mean by that, and I'm going to save that to talk about in answer to some of Colin's upcoming questions. Um, but suffice it to say, I take my students romping. And, um, and it's based on sort of one insight, my one sort of motto of IF life, which is design is play. Now, I realize it may not be that when you're making a living at it. Um, the way that you see my harp in the background, the way that I played harp um, um, before I got paid for it was different than how I played harp after I was paid for it. So we all know that in the artistic professions, right? But students who are not in a position of having to design for money, right, um, can play like free play. Um, and so that's, I'm just gonna stop there. Sort of design is design is play. And um, that's how I teach IF, so. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Um, that was great. Uh, one, just uh, because we talked all about this theater and add another aspect about myself. Um, I have a, I've been doing game stuff and I've, I have some like small game design stuff I've done. I've been doing tabletop games for since I was 12, you know, way back then. Uh, but I also do um, uh, immersive um, interactive performance stuff. And I've managed uh, huge performances with like 250 artists and volunteers and whatnot that were just these immersive interactive performance pieces where the, the guests were interacting with stuff and with the artist. And there's this, there definitely is a huge overplay between like game design and performance, especially when you do this more interactive performance. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of that plays into this interacting online as well. So that's uh, a passion for me. And I, I totally see the interplay that all of you have been talking about. Uh, so uh, we'll get into discussion. Uh, I have a few questions um, and we'll just, anyone, either any of you can jump in and, and answer them. Uh, if members in the audience who are watching this on Twitch have questions, you're welcome to ask them and I will interject them or ask them at the end, uh, whatever makes the most sense. Um, so uh, my first question is, how do online tools, um, the online tools that you've been working on, especially, but other, just in general too, your thoughts on how do these affect the nature of storytelling? Um, and do they lead to different experience? Do they focus the experience? Do they change it in any way uh, that you see? And you want to jump in? I can jump in. Go for it. I've, I've been thinking deeply about this partly in terms of how can, what tools, what new formats, what features can I add to StorySynth to continue to 
expand the design space of types of experiences that can be created with it. Um, I think digital is great for a number of things, which I might end up rattling off in a bit, but I think the most important might be scaffolding and how, because, because digital is, you know, gives you a kind of infinite amount to work with, even if you're only presenting a little bit to the participants at any given time, uh, it means that whatever a player might need um, can be sitting there just off screen ready to pop in at the right minute. So some examples. I think uh, it's really, really great for just-in-time instructions. So compared to tabletop storytelling where somebody has to either know all the rules in advance or sort of be like flipping through things, a game can per per perfectly sort of drip feed out the instructions just as you need them. Um, and uh, and likewise, uh, by either like hovering over the right elements or clicking sort of a little pop-up modal, you can quickly refer back to them too without disrupting everyone else. And it kind of democratizes access to that, that information about the game. Uh, another way that it provides scaffolding, digital tools can provide scaffolding so well, is just by having this like infinite list of possible suggestions for where you might take the story. So I know uh, one problem that beginner storytellers often have is, uh, especially ones who might not be as familiar with the tropes of a, a certain type of story, is just knowing where to take the story next, what possible options are available. So the fact that digital tools can just provide this amazing, constantly re-rollable, regenerative regeneratable list of good ideas and prompts is super empowering for folks who might otherwise be intimidated and feel like they're improvising, they'd be improvising without a net. So I, I think those are some of the most exciting bits. There's there's other bits that um, I can also uh, relate and reflect on from the, the more serious game side in terms of digital games, being able to manage state in a way that would be too complex or cumbersome for an at the table experience. So whether you're having running a a simulation, so a specific example, in some of the election games, we've run a uh, simulation of like voter models and um, opinion polling. And so as players are taking actions, that's all updating in the background. If we were to do that without digital tools, it would be, you would need a whole team to run it as opposed to just sort of one facilitator who's quickly updating things. So I can I can go on ad nauseum about other things <laughs> digital is great at, but I want I'd love to hear from that. From that's great. Um, I have a specific thing. I remember like I watched your Narrowscope thing, Doug, and uh, you were talking, and I know Moat is very like there's a very personal experience with it. Um, and I know in the Narrowscope you touched upon like uh, the queer experience and dealing with that um, with storytelling and and in kind of the difference in what you're trying to create. Can you talk on that? Or if you don't want to talk on that, that's great. But like, I, I felt that was an interesting point. Um, yeah, you put me on the spot there. I think that, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that like, you know, I think what I was speaking to there was specifically this idea of sort of the, the inversion of the world of rules and the inversion of, you know, the idea of there being a game that is that is top down enforcing rules rather than sort of people creating things, certainly in the digital space where that is kind of not been something that is sort of been the focus of a lot of digital game development. Um, you know, I think I referred to as sort of a, a querying of the, the game rules experience. But I think that what Randy, something that Randy said was really clicked with me about this idea of, you know, the, the, the way that technology can support player storytelling, right? Um, especially for players who are struggling with improvising, I, I kind of see two angles of that. The first one was, like, you know, especially given my and my husband's backgrounds in, you know, in performance, it was, you know, we were a couple of months into our closed beta when we realized that a lot of people who were being attracted to Moat needed a lot more support and kind of how to just jump in and just like, oh, just go and make up a, like, make up a character, right? And like, that was something a lot of people weren't really prepared to venture, um, you know, without, you know, a lot more support than what we were giving them. And I, and so I think that idea is really interesting. I also think that, um, you know, when you can take the experience of role play um, and of of sharing creative storytelling ideas, which are which can be quite exposing, um, and you can find a way to mediate them for people. Um, I think that you know generators and things are a great way to inject ideas that nobody has to take accountability for. <laughs> nobody has to say, "Well, this is my idea. What do you guys think of it?" Um, but also um, 
you know, to be able to be a character, especially if you're able to work through a separate medium like text, whether that's something like Moat or something like just classical play by post, right, where you're able to mediate your, your role play experience through that text. You know, you, you think about that, um, that moment when like even just strip storytelling down to its bare bones, we're sitting around a table and we're making up a story together. It requires a huge amount of energy from all of the people involved, um, not just to come up with ideas, but to maintain the sort of the the reality of the fiction, right? And and sometimes it can feel like we're just talking and did that, did that happen? Or is it just an idea that we're exploring? Um, and when you're able to kind of, you know, use use technology to like fix some of those, those ideas um, in, in space and time, for example, writing them down in text. I'd also argue that this is the, the primary role of the ritual of dice rolling in a, in a tabletop role-playing game is to create a before and after causal relationship between things um, that, that everybody at the table can accept as, as kind of ground truth. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're, you know, um, like, uh, the, the, you know, that's, that's kind of a place where technology can support these kind of storytelling situations that we didn't have before. So. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh, and Judith, I mean, you have a long sure. history on inter interactive fiction and, uh, what's your thought that how that affects the, the nature of storytelling and when the audience itself can manipulate their uh, choices. Well, having come to IF through theater um, I had and sort of having that period of my life overlap, I could see that online storytelling provides safety in a variety of ways, where the amount of um, vulnerability you have when you are doing improvisation in a theater setting, and especially for kids and the possibility of being bullied, et cetera, et cetera, makes you have to fake it a lot in ways and tell stories which are not necessarily authentic to you because you're performing in your social life. Total disclosure, um, I'm a sociologist, so I, I, so <laughs> I just started not paying attention to my academic life, but my, in academic life, I'm a sociologist, but whatever. Um, so so what, what the, the sort of social relations of collaborative storytelling in a theater situation is that people who have um, a personality which allows them to do that can do that and they step to the front and they love the stage and they get all the attention. And the people who can't, can't assert themselves in that way still have stories to tell, still have things to say, to get relevate, relegated to secondary positions in other people's stories. When we would take, do improvise a play in a classroom, for example, and put it on the stage. Well, ultimately, you know, who rises to the front and whose story gets told, et cetera. And I was always aware there were more stories there because I would sometimes say, okay, so not everybody spoke today, write down on a piece of paper, a story that didn't get told or something that you wish we could do or blah, blah, blah. And I would go through these stories and it was, oh, oh my gosh, the things they told me in those stories, right? That were happening in their lives. I mean, some of them I had to give to the teacher and say, I think, I think this is, has to go to like social welfare. I mean, I, I mean, they, they told me things which they could not perform, but the online storytelling, which can give you anonymity and it can give you, I mean, lots and lots of things that these tools can give you. And in fact, they don't even have to be public. You can make these games for your own consumption or you and your friends, or maybe you would make it public, whatever, allows you to sort of enter into that powerful, sometimes sort of sacred theater space of telling one story. So in other ways, I don't think it's very different. Like, I mean, I think that storytelling processes offline are not that different from storytelling processes online. So, um, and then there are benefits and there's access because of course, the other kind of accessibility is the kids that do really well, kids. And when I mean kid, I'm from second grader up to like, you know, 70 year olds in my class of kids. I mean, students, um, people that I'm teaching um, uh, that, there's a certain advantage for people who are techie in a way and have had previous tech skills and other people can get really intimidated about things which are really not that big of a deal. Like everybody is like, oh, in form seven so hard. Um, and it's just really, really not. I mean, I, you know, I have, you know, second and third graders learning to, you know, program in inform. It's, I think there's just a lot of mystique around it. Um, and, 
and so it's possible to, to, to teach these tools in a way which makes them accessible and easy to use. And then there is this power. Um, yeah, so I think that my, my word in answer to this question is gonna be safety. Um, and and sort of an ability to oh safety and um, um, endless horizon right so so kids kids and when I mean kid really I'm really talking every age of kid um, you have an idea and and your you know your first idea on no we cannot like have lightning strike on the stage well, I would love to have lightning strike on the stage well you can have lightning strike in a narrative game and it can do tremendous damage and you don't have to have the graphical skills to be able to like draw that like if they want to do it in a video game in some sort of graphical game and there are you know they're you know they don't have the chops to do what they imagine and very frustrating for kids right kids all ages and um, but in IF in IF you could draw anything, really anything, right? So then that's the other thing. So that so the access to these tools are both make you safe, you can tell your own stories, and you are not limited by your skills, either your extroversion, your performance. But but of course we have other accessibility issues. Uh, thanks. I think that 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 was like I really like the safety aspect. Um, I with that I'm going to jump into a user question, which kind of plays directly into that. Um, and not all of you have to answer, but a couple of answers to this. Um, how do you respond? Uh, basically, how how do you respond when like that ability to avoid accountability because you're kind of on the space and you might be anonymous or whatnot um, can lead to like threatening or dangerous activity um whether that's like harm to like you know threatening harm to other people uh hateful language or to themselves um like is there a way to avoid that or um you know solve it after the fact do you feel well i can just really follow up on mine and and then pass it to the yeah. other two because i don't uh the games that my students play never um are not going into those platforms. So I, okay. I heavily, I heavily moderate um, my environments. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I feel like that's been sort of a, a, an open question for 25 years. How do we keep people safe online, <laughs> right? How do we, yeah. right? And and you look at yeah. the, you look at the big major platforms today, and and their their response to it seems to be to try to, you know, make it not their responsibility or or you know ignore it in some ways right um i for us with making moat our focus has been very much on trying to bake in safety from the beginning that's been um something that's been very important to us ideally you know you're you know you're not you're not playing with someone that you don't know and 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 you you aren't you aren't required to be exposed to people that you don't know and and you're able to sort of opt out and and kind of remove yourself from from the environment at any time that you want but it's a that's a that's a very large unresolved question in online, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a, an unresolved question that I mean, is so idiosyncratic to every online context. I mean, I, I think none of the social media platforms have cracked it. It's one of those things that any any flavor of content moderation isn't going to work at scale, um, and just being really really thoughtful from the beginning, like sort of as Doug was saying, if you could bake it in, um, how you're thinking about moderation, how you're thinking about safety from, from the start, you're less likely to get into trouble, but then always having it be a through line as you're continuing to design and test and iterate and grow and saying, you know, who who's most at risk? How do we create, uh, how do we empower people to um, create a safer environment themselves? And then when that fails, how do we how do we make sure we can get involved that we can easily we pull them? But hard, hard problem. What's yeah, it's a hard problem. About What's interesting about the three of us, which is sort of an interesting group you've brought together here, Colin. It, I, I was trying to go for very disparate, right? well, but still disparate, but in the got, same weird ballpark got, of this. But you got one weird thing in common for all of us, which is that we all create what you might call sand painting kinds of experiences, meaning that they, they people using, especially the tools that Randy and Doug make are having an experience um, and they may become a product, maybe that they could, but but the real point of the experience is the experience and it's live and it's not being witnessed by other people, right? Yeah. It's an experience that you're having. And when I say 
design as play in my games is that we don't have the expectation that very many people are gonna wanna play the quad game. I know that's funny, right? They, but the, the experience of doing it is the doing of it. And in that sense, it doesn't, it's, ephemer, it's ephemera in, in a weird way or experience or a therapy session, like the way that you don't record a therapy session and play it back later. Like you remember what happened in that session, but you're not trying to make something out of it the way one does if one's making a podcast. But if you go to, you know, you, you go to your therapy thing with a bunch of other people that you know, nobody's recording it and is selling it to anybody to watch. So there's a private part of design. All you'd have to do is we could have an interesting conversation with everybody here at this whole conference to talk about the games that they never made public, right? So the closet, the basement, yeah. but also the ones that you made for your own angst or for your own grief or for your own, whatever it was, like those experiences, those experiences, like um, journaling, like your poetry that you, oh my God, do not share. And um, you know that there's a certain level of game design that is that stuff. And you do a lot of that stuff when you're learning, right? You shouldn't be sharing your first games, <laughs> right? Cause I'll come back to haunt you if you made, you know, right? You don't want them on itch.io when you were just starting, right? They don't go away. You can't get rid of them, right? Um, so, so I think that there's the safety issue. So in, in answer to the question who asked about unsafety is that you will self moderate too, knowing that it's a, it's a dangerous world out there Right, and you've written this personal, personal thing. Like, why do I need the public to look at this? Like in an unmoderated space, or because it's something I can share with people I trust. Right. So not all not all games have to make a ton of money, especially when you're still learning your craft. I'd love to kind of you know bounce off of something that that Judith just brought up, which is yeah. this idea that like um, you know the the idea of not saving things that was something that we built into Moat from the beginning. The idea that the content of your story is we don't save we we process it on the server to get it out to the other players, but we don't even by the end of the story we don't have a copy right. So we created this sort of hacky save as HTML feature based on player request right, where you're actually just saving what's already been downloaded to your browser over the course of play, but. What we've been finding is that, you know, as we, you know, as we work with the people in our open beta and, and the players who are playing right now, they're looking for ways to be able to, you know, have and curate and have hosted online, you know, rich artifacts of play from their their moat stories. And that's causing us to now kind of rethink a lot of assumptions that we had about how we were going to handle their data. Um, and at the same time, you know, we talked earlier about um, design being performance, but especially over the past year, play has become incredibly performative in the community. You know, actual plays just have blown up. And this idea that you want to play and have people watch you while you play, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing that thing where I'm I, that I shouldn't do, which is sharing roadmap items off the cuff. But, you know, something that we're working on is a way to have people be able to spectate on a, on a moat story while people are playing it. Um, but it's, it's raising a lot of questions about kind of safety and, and privacy and, and how players can be in control. And also, you know, as a, as a two person non-commercial operation, how do we protect ourselves? I think it also dovetails with um, safety tools, like for example, lines and veils or X cart, right? And, um, you know, a, another angle of safety when playing these kinds of games, when when telling stories that can make you very vulnerable and, and expose you to other people, even if you know them, right? And, um, you know, there's a lot of discourse about safety tools going on right now. Um, and, you know, thinking about how much should we be encoding those kinds of tools into technology? Like all technology, they can end up you know, you know, there's a danger that they end up creating the aesthetic of a solved problem, even when, you know, the, um, you know, the, the actual, the actual thing that they, they, they came to solve may be able to persist, right? So it's a big question. Uh, can, uh, do you have something to add there? I have another I question. Have a, go for it. Engine building off of yeah, the two that we're saying, but if you, if you have somewhere else, somewhere else you want to go, uh, take it there. Uh, yeah, I want to kind of like, branch off of that. We've had a bunch of, I want to first say, we've had a number of questions in come through Twitch and I thank you for them. I'm, 
I don't know if we're going to get to all of them. Um, I will pass them on to our, I'm going to try to include them here. Um, but if we don't get to all of them, uh, some of our speakers um, will be in the Discord chat after it. Um, and we can potentially answer them there. Um, so I'm sorry if I don't get to all the questions. Um, uh, the I will answer one. One person said my, for myself, do you think online tools can be used as a complement for traditional RPGs instead of just providing a standalone? Yes. Obviously, Doug is working with Avery and creating. There's a number of platforms online that do that. Um, I kind of was focusing this panel kind of more on creating a digital platform that kind of does its own standalone thing. So that's what I'm... Randy's tool uh, both creates standalone games, but also you can mimic things like For the Queen and whatnot. So there is definitely overlap. Um, so to get to the question, I'm going to combine one of the user's questions and kind of one of my own. Uh, there was a question on, on the, the fact that online play can sometimes feel cold or static and asking what techniques can overcome that feeling. I'm going to weave that into a question of my own and, and kind of hit personal for all of you, which is, what are there any personal experiences you've had with interactive fiction or online storytelling that like moved you personally or inspired you in some way, shape, or form? So uh, I'm gonna start with you, Judith. Okay, well, you're gonna have to get an educator story here. So um, yeah, that's great. One of, uh, that's one, of the, one of the reasons, I have many reasons for teaching IF. As I said, I teach it in any circumstance. Um, uh, but one of the reasons I do it is to um, bring more um, um, unrepresented communities to programming and digital literacies. And one reason uh, why the usual suspects have become programmers um, is the way uh, programming is wedded to math and um, the way, um, and I'm not going to get into the problem with our educational system, but suffice it to say, people have <laughs> math anxiety, and math anxiety gives them programming anxiety. But uh, Inform 7 is a really intriguing first programming language um, because it teaches, it has in it all the bits that any other programming language has. It is, uh, um, you know, what's an object hierarchy and what are conditional statements and databases and, and et cetera, et cetera, Every, all the bits that you need to teach in an intro programming class. But instead of using algebra, like we do in any Python class is al uses algebra, right? So, but you can use narrative logic, narrative logic to teach all these programming classes. So I get in my classes, students who've failed or are terrified to um, pass to, to enter into certain programs because they have to take a programming course and they're afraid to fail. So I have the students who come in and so then I say, okay, you're gonna learn a program and you're gonna make a story and it's gonna, um, it's gonna be a historical story because it's a general education course, which is a US minorities general education course. So you're gonna write a story about some uh, episode in history and you're gonna do it interactively while you're learning to program. And so some of them freeze up a little bit. Um, and I had this young woman who like was kind of hating it. And she um, and she said, I keep getting this error, this error, this error screen, right? She was like haunted by this error. Well, so gradually as she understood it, the error screen would go away and she started to get it. And she decided she was gonna write, she was gonna write a story about the first African-American surgeon in the state of Illinois. And she wanted to um, replicate an open heart surgery in her game. So she, so she was very ambitious. And I was like, I have to read her story like this because it was really graphic, which was so good. <laughs> she walks you through like doing the whole surgery. And she did, she worked so hard. And in what she said in her, at the end, she had to reflect on the whole experience. And she started out by saying, I hate math. I'm bad at math. I never want to do any program. I never want to do this and that. And, she, and then she talked about the error screen and the horror of that and then working it out piece by piece, step by step by step by step. She told a story and then she said, and I just declared a minor in informatics, right? So that, um, that, that experience of persisting through the technical difficulties to tell this story, which was, oh, I should say she was an African-American woman for whom it was really important to tell that history. So she was actually able to push through on those technical skills to, to tell this story. And then it gave her this sense of confidence. And so this was, this was storytelling that really um, 
gave power to somebody to actualize other um, parts of their lives and ambitions. So that's when I was pretty proud of using IF to do complex things other than like make fun games. That's great. Uh, so uh, we have our 10 minute warning, but we'll let's finish this question with all of you because I really want to hear some. That's an that's an amazing story, by the way. That was that was heart touching. Uh, Randy, let's jump to you. Sure, I'll, I'll just give a very quick answer on this one. I mean, I. Not not tied to story synth, but in general, um, playing tools, uh, play, playing games online, loving the fact that there's this infinite canvas. So I've I've played in games where we've had a, a Notion Word doc kind of thing open, as well as like a Figma, and, you know, an infinite canvas, and the ability to just create maps ad hoc, bring in reference images, um, keep track of just everything, where we can just all all be chipping in, and the energy of the world building and creativity just feeds on each other in a beautiful way, in in ways that if we were just playing around a table would be probably a little bit more limited. Um, so I don't know. I just, I, I love that, that expressive element. Um, yeah. Expressive. So, so essentially that, like, so it, that kind of answers the question of like, how do you avoid the cold and static? If the, you're really focusing on that world building and everyone's adding something to it and that they can all see together, then I think that can be really strong. I love that. And I love the idea of sort of um, hacking these sort of design productivity tools to um, to use them for a different purpose. I don't know if anybody has ever organized their 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 story game on like Jira or something, but I'd I'd love to see that. Um, yeah, I'll I'll tell a story from really a little over a year ago. You know, we um, this is, I guess it's kind of a trite story, but we had we were suffering through here on the West Coast and, and in Portland a week longer of um, the sky just turned brown and the sun disappeared and, and you couldn't go outside and uh, the, the wildfire smoke that was just completely choking us. I remember that week uh, starting every morning with my team at work on Zoom, um, all from our you know respective bunkers um, and just sort of staring at each other and um it got to the end of the week and you know we've got a we've got a small discord community for the for the moat beta um and we try to do kind of pickup games there with uh with players and and we had a group who really really wanted to play and i was just i was just not feeling it. i said okay we can play but we have to do something um that takes place uh somewhere where the sky is blue <laughs> And we did for an hour. We we played. The, it was sort of like an like a. I think it was sort of an uncharted themed um, tropical island event adventure with crystal water and blue skies. And I um, honestly couldn't believe how refreshed and how like I like I had actually taken a real break um, from uh, the horror of life um, for for a moment there by kind of experiencing and sort of having the weird experience you have on mode of writing and reading at the same time. Um, and, and kind of having this, uh, this experience. So, um, uh, that's great. That's, that's a wonderful, wonderful moment. You mentioned about like using these productivity tools. I've been for one of the games I run, uh, we've been using this tools called Miro, which is this online whiteboard tool. And it's been, like it's great because like it's really easy to just kind of like plop up like post-it notes essentially and that's a lot how i run my games because it's just like oh uh so uh you run into uh your friend what's his name and you know and like they'll like oh like, well, his name is uh jabberly dudes okay all right and he's like slapped down a like an index card essentially on the screen and like now we have like this character we can just keep building this world really fast with that tool nice um have essentially five minutes left uh so uh let's uh go around and um basically if you have a quick final thought but also tell people how they can find you and reach you um and your projects uh you, you know you, you have your soundcloud whatever <laughs> uh and uh we'll start from the start from uh my right left whatever uh judith go for it Sure. You can find me on Twitter at Judith Pintar. Um, my website's judithpintar.com. My lab at the University of Illinois is el3.judithpintar.com. But if you look up EL3, EL3 stands for the Electronic Literatures and Literacies Lab. 
Um, so you can read about what I do at the University of Illinois. I'm um, so excited to say we now have a game studies minor. We have a thriving game studies community, but we didn't have a degree program. And we now have de facto many majors because we're pairing our game studies minor with um, many, many undergraduate majors. So we're going to be an exciting place for undergraduates. And we hope to have a grad minor there soon. So maybe I'll see you at the University of Illinois. Um, let's see. Is that it for my social media? I at Judith Pintar also on Facebook. Um, so I think that's, that's me. And, uh, Randy? Yeah, you can find me online everywhere at, uh, Randy Lubin. Um, my website's randylubin.com. It'll have pointers to places. Storysynth.org is the platform I've been building. It's free and open source. And, uh, if you are designing something cool, please share it with me. If you want feature requests, need help with anything, please reach out. Um, there's a discord, but you can also just email pretty much anything at storysynth.org will get sent to me. Um, and one, one closing thought, because we have a minute. Yeah. Is that I, we didn't really touch on this too much, but I love how, well, you just mentioned a little bit, but just how great these digital tools are for novice designers. And specifically what makes them so great, at least some of the things in my mind, are that it's so easy to just copy, remix, and iterate on things. And so on the on the copying and remixing side, you can you can learn and get your feet wet by taking an existing game and then starting to tweak it to your, your own delight. I mean, the quad game feels like it hits heavy notes of that. Um, okay, so but, really, really quick at Neroscope this coming year, I'll probably do another boot camp in Form 7 boot camp. So if you've always wanted to um, to learn in Form 7 parser based, you can take my boot camp um, without having to enroll at the University of Illinois. Super and cool. how do you find Neroscope about that? Um, well, just you can just, uh, well, we, we're just now planning next spring's Neroscope. So you can just look up, you can just Google Neroscope and you'll find info. Yeah. Nothing up yeah. about next year yet, but. Um, Doug, 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 sorry, Doug, we stole your time. <laughs> <laughs> you can, I'll be quick. You can find me on Twitter at Doug Valena. You can find Moat at whatismoat.com, M-O-T-E. Um, and uh, we're in open beta, uh, so please join us. Excellent. Um, we got three minutes, so I'll little, let's hit uh, a couple of the other questions. Um, uh, the... There was a really interesting question. I don't know how to answer it, but maybe one of you do. Uh, what do you think of the future slash past of narrative instrument archaeology? <laughs> I'd love to learn what it is. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> maybe that person, whoever asked that question, be in the Discord and explain that question because I'm yeah. really fascinated with that question. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um. And uh, is um, it's it's basically about it. Um, um, I uh, just as like a um, like an additional thing I want to add about like story synth. I've actually created a couple of games on it, and I uh, and it's really interesting. Um, like I've played run a couple of games on that. I've also done a couple of things on Twine and played with that. Um, I've had a lot of fun with story synth and ran. Randy's stuff also, if you are a budding programmer, uh, StorySynth is on GitHub um, and you could look at all the code and how it works. Um, and you can play, it's in Vue, right? It's in Vue, but you don't really need to go deep in Vue. You don't need to be an expert at all to start tweaking it. And if you're looking to tweak in an interesting direction and need help, reach out. I know a few folks who have sort of forked the whole code base and are tweaking it to their needs and it's, oh, it's so cool, so exciting. So you can play with play with that. You can play with Inform Seven. Like if you are a budding person wanting to create these experiences online, uh, Doug, just as like tech stuff, since we're on that, like how, what do you write Moat in? Um, I was surprised. I looked back a few weeks ago, and Moat is now mostly TypeScript, but our core okay. engine is written in Java, Got it. and the front end is in uh, in React. All right. Well, we're wrapping up here. Uh, thank all of you. I thank all of you for this is a really interesting conversation that did this, which is what I love. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll join us in Discord. I'll be over in the Discord myself. Um, and uh, take care, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. And so happy to meet you all. Thanks for bringing Thanks us much. together, Colin. <laughs>